Session 4C, Combined Effects of External and Internal Homophobia. It's hardly surprising that the combined effects of external oppression, i.e. discrimination, and internal oppression, that is stigmatised identity, are significant. In January 2014, Youth Chances published their findings from the biggest ever survey of LGBTQ young people in England. Over 7,000 young people took part. These findings are fairly consistent with other research from abroad. I'm showing slides which relate specifically to three data sets of findings from research I've conducted in Calderdale with regard to mental health, substance misuse, sexual vulnerability. However, where possible, I will also compare these with the Youth Chances data. Mental health. You'll see that there appears to have been a reduction in the number of LGBT young people attending Gaelic who experienced depression from 82% in 1998 down to 72% in 2008 and again down to 70% in 2011. Anxiety dropped from 67 to 56%, then went back up again to 65%. The youth chances findings are not strictly comparable in that they put depression and anxiety together and asked participants if they'd ever gone for medical help for these conditions, whereas in the Gallic interviews, participants were simply asked if they'd ever suffered from depression or anxiety. With regard to suicidal thoughts, these have gradually come down over the years for Gallic members from 80% in 98 to 72 in 2008 and again down to 65% in 2010-11. Nevertheless, these are significantly higher than the Youth Chances findings where 44% of the participants had suicidal thoughts. With regard to actual suicide attempts, the Calderdale findings rose significantly from 1998, when 13% 1-3 had attempted suicide, to 56% in 2008, and then down slightly to 50% in 2010-11. Only 16% of the Youth Chances participants, LGBTQ participants, had attempted suicide, which nevertheless is double that of their heterosexual control group. It's worth noting that Australian research published in February 2014 and conducted with 1,000 young LGBTs also found that 16% had made suicide attempts. The levels of self-harm have also arisen shockingly from 40% in 98 to 74% in 2008 to 82% in 2010 11. Again, this is higher than youth chances where 52% of participants had self harmed. In the Australian survey, 33% had self harmed. There are several possible reasons why the Calderdale findings are significantly higher than the youth chances findings. First of all, as I've already acknowledged, the small numbers in Calderdale could result in bias. Or indeed, the method of data collection could have, could have an impact. The Gallic data is based on interviews collected as part of, interview of individual needs assessments with young people attending the youth group, rather than an anonymous online survey. More of the Gallic participants came from poor working class families with poorer education than the Youth Chances young people. At some point, there'll be an analysis of the Youth Chances findings, which will look at class differences, as well as other demographics. The Gallic members live in an area where there are no other targeted services for LGBT youth, and very few mainstream services meet the, meet the needs of LGBT young people. They were therefore very isolated. Or it could be, that it is simply because vulnerable young people attend Gaelic. For me, the most probable reasons for the worst findings in Calderdale are class and isolation. 
It's worth keeping an eye open for further analysis of the Youth Chances data, as they will also be broken down into regions. As part of the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment in Calderdale, health surveys have been conducted with 14 one four secondary schools, with Year 7, that's 11 to 12 year olds, and Year 10, that's 14 to 15 year olds, in 2009 and 2010. Unfortunately, the published findings combine both age groups. The only one which singles out the older group is with regard to self-harm, where the survey found that the highest group to self-harm were girls in year 10, and this was 23.5%. Compare this with 82% for Gallic members, almost four times higher. Substance misuse. The number of Gallic members smoking has risen significantly, and the figures are worse in Calderdale. It's worth noting that the Gallic findings are nearly three times higher than those found in the Calderdale School Survey, which was 25%. It's difficult to compare the alcohol data between Gallic and youth chances, which is why I've only used the findings for 2010-11. However, this does suggest that alcohol misuse is possibly worse in Calderdale. In the Calderdale School Survey, 20% regularly used alcohol. There appears to be similar levels of drug use amongst Gallic members and the participants of Youth Chances. It should be noted that in the Calderdale School Survey, only 12.4% had used illegal drugs, less than half of Gallic members. Risky sexual health. American research has for many years found that LGB young people were more likely than heterosexual youth to get pregnant or beget a child. Both the Gallic data and the Youth Chances data came up with similar findings, i.e. 13 and 12% respectively. This has clear implications for teenage pregnancy strategies. Again, American research has found that LGBT young people are more likely than heterosexuals to experience violence in childhood, including sexual abuse. This has regularly come up in the Calderdale data and has now been found to be an issue in the Youth Chances Survey. Getting drunk has clear implications for young LGBTs with regard to safer sex. Whilst this also came up as a problem in the Youth Chances findings, it would appear to be a bigger problem with the Gallic members. The Youth Chances Survey did not include questions about aggression, but as a result of witnessing it amongst members of Gallic, in 2011, we included new questions on aggression and found that out of the last 10 members interviewed, more than half had middle to high level of aggression in comparison with the Calderdale School Survey, which found that the majority had low aggression levels. In my opinion, there are certain factors which make some LGBT young people more vulnerable than others. This is based on both research and experience. Those who are more vulnerable are those who identify early, they're much more likely to be isolated. Those who are not yet out and getting support, again, they're more isolated. Those who are experiencing homophobic, transphobic bullying. Those young people who are not getting support from their parents and especially those whose parents' family are homophobic those LGBT young people who are homeless, those who live in areas where there is no support and they are isolated, such as rural areas and small towns, those who are multi-oppressed, again, they're much more likely to be isolated, those who do not conform to gender stereotypes, I'm talking about both young trans people and young butch lesbians and sissy gay boys, those who live in areas where mainstream services are not meeting their needs and there is no targeted support. Those who come from dysfunctional families. Those who abuse substances. Those who have been sexually abused. And those who are in conflict regarding their sexual orient orientation or gender identity, possibly for religious reasons. 
Recent research also suggests that bisexuals are more vulnerable. However, I have to say I haven't found this in my, my own work or the data I've collected in Calderdale. Research doesn't seem to differentiate between those people who identify as bisexual as part of the coming out process, which makes them, them much more vulnerable, and those bisexuals who have a genuine bisexual orientation. It's been pointed out, however, that because of biphobia in both the heterosexual and homosexual communities, bisexuals are less likely to be out and are therefore more likely to be isolated, a significant factor in mental health problems. This is clearly a very gloomy picture, but there are factors which help young LGBT people surmount the major problems facing them. These include coming out with support, family acceptance and support, accessing a peer support group, schools that really challenge homophobic bullying, accurate information and positive role models. I've also found over the years that conducting a comprehensive needs assessment with our members and working with them to develop an action plan geared to meeting their needs can significantly help in reducing their vulnerabilities. One of the main ingredients for them was being able to access peer support via an LGBT youth group. In fact, it's worth pointing out that all of the suicidal attempts by Gallic members were made before they accessed the youth group. <clears throat> At Gallic, we would use this data not only to develop individual action plans, but also with the consolidated findings to give inputs to mainstream services, professionals and politicians. Our member presentation group incorporated these findings alongside their own individual stories. It was a pretty powerful presentation. The Youth Chances findings found that what LGBT young people most wanted was emotional support and to be able to meet other young people with similar experiences. At the same time, Youth Chances found that only 46 agencies responded to their providers survey across England. I've recently looked at other sources such as the LGBT Consortium Directory and the Queer Youth Network and both confirm that the number of LGBT youth groups has, re has reduced significantly over the past few years. As well as being proud of the member presentations, I'm also very proud of the following five minute video Gallic made for the Department of Health. Well, we set up Gallic in 1999. First and foremost, we have once a week youth group. So for two and a half hours a week, young LGBT people can come and they don't need to fear about anybody shouting at them, shouting abuse. They can be themselves. <laughs> I got referred here by my nana. In her words, I've blossomed. Coming to this group kind of made me feel a bit more normal. And it's just such a such a difference to be able to be open with people. Even find romance at times. Mm. It's brilliant. There's players and well all sorts of different I don't think the NHS serves the group of young people that I work with very well at all at the moment. I'd say the biggest problem, health problem for LGBT, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender young people in Calderdale, is mental health. And when I say mental health, I'm talking about depression, um, self-harm, attempted suicide, phobias, anxiety, and then of course linked into that is often alcohol and drug issues. I am now 16. It originally started to when I realised I was gay yeah, around 12, 13 years old. I would describe it as being very, very, very lonely and isolated because you have, definitely have no one to talk to. I, I was getting on bullied really, really badly and um, 
uh, I think it got a little bit too much and I did um, attempt suicide but um, didn't work properly. So. I think I've been bullied since year eight, calling me um, gay and stuff and saying I was just really camp. But um, yeah, we'll have to agree with that because I'm really camp um, at times. But, um, but it was upsetting. The level of homophobic bullying, I've, I've witnessed it over the last seven years, it's rising. So nearly every member of, of my group have experienced some level of homophobic bullying. I didn't really come out at home because um, at the time I was staying at my boyfriend's and then um, when I got home I noticed that my bedroom had been changed around and um, my cupboard that I had kept a certain book in um, had been changed around and obviously <laughs> my parents had found out. I can't stress the importance of the difference of family parents accepting the child can make and literally it can make the difference between life and death. My dad was all right with it because um, he had a suspicion for about a year, so he said. But I think it was just my mum who was all right with it, but not so much because she was probably hoping I would get a girlfriend and not a boyfriend. And... Cheers. Well, Scott is my first ever boyfriend. He's as camp as are all tense, as some people would say. One of the problems that young LGBT people face is accessing appropriate support. And most mainstream services, they're not aware of the needs of young LGBT people, so therefore they can't meet those needs. Whenever a young person contacts Gallic, I get out the needs assessment tool and I interview them. It goes through sexual health, emotional well-being, the big section on, on mental health, alcohol and drugs, isolation. Quite often it's the first time the young person's been able to talk freely about being gay and about how that has affected their life. When we finish, finished, I then go back over it and together we work out individual action plans. What's the next step? I've recently started going to counselling sessions um, which are organised by JAM. I went to go see Alinda. It's difficult for young people generally to, to find um, counselling, but to find people that are actively supportive of a gay organisation, I would say, was even more difficult. We're funded partially and managed by the Primary Care Trust, Calderdale Primary Care Trust. And the PCT have, have always managed as well and have been extremely loyal to us. I guess if Jan wasn't there, these young people, what would they do, would be the question. Would they come here? Um, would they use other youth services, um, youth groups? Would they confidently walk into a, a, a doctor's surgery or a clinic to access these services? I would say no. The NHS needs to have a training programme. I would love to see when a young person turns up at A&E, they've taken an overdose, that whoever whoever's there in the hospital understands the needs of young LGB people and can ask sensitive questions and find out whether sexual orientation has got anything to do with that. I think she's been a real help to the group and to me and I want to thank her.